Americans, including First Nations people like Pearl Keenan, uh, were completely surprised by the Americans' arrival. I was just a young girl then, and I was coming along about, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Dogs were running up along the shore, and all of a sudden they took off into the bush, just uh, going. And I yelled and hollered at them to come back here. And all of a sudden, they took off. They never listened to me. Just boom, the way they went. All of a sudden, my God, I heard somebody yelling up there. Hey, 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 hey. Holy smoke, is it? That's unusual. And the dogs turned right around and came right back to me. As soon as they heard my voice, they just came right back. And I thought, what? That's funny. Because there's nobody, uh, there was only three people here, at, or four people here at Tesla. And then I went down to the post office in the store. There's, uh, they're building a highway all the way from uh, Dawson Creek to Fairbanks. And I can remember looking up the hill, and it was dark, and seeing these lights coming over into, right into the wilderness, you know, just over the mountains, like over the hill. Just marveled at it. Just really fantastic to see something like that. Some troops had it worse than others. No troops had it as bad as the some 3,500 African Americans. In 1942, the armed forces were still segregated. The black troops were given the worst jobs in the worst places with the worst equipment, and that certainly didn't change when they came up here. Uh, they weren't allowed to come into Whitehorse or any other populated area, and this was all thanks to the commander of the Alaskan Defense. He was General Simon Bolivar Buckner, and this is what he wrote. Dear General Sturdivant, the high wages offered to unskilled labor here would attract a large number of Negroes to settle after the war, interbreeding with Indians and Eskimos, producing an astonishingly objectionable race of mongrels. There was no such thing as self-respect then. You were a soldier, and you either did or you got court martial And every soldier there didn't want to be court martial Hayward Obrey. And if you read about what happened during those times, they said, keep them away because we don't want integration with the Eskimos or with the Indians or anybody. And so we were kept into the wilderness, and that's where it was to get that highway through. Many of the new arrivals, black and white, knew what to do and how to do it, but not where. Our knowledge was as blank as this part of the map. And their instructions simply were, we'll proceed in a northwesterly direction. And that's pretty sensible, because if you stay in a northwesterly direction, you'll re eventually reach Fairbanks. But the fact that there's a couple of mountain ranges in between, uh, they had no concept of, because they didn't have good maps either. Roads took the place of wagon paths which took the place of horse trails, which took the place of walking paths, which took the place of animal tracks. So the precise location of many highways was determined centuries before the bulldozers arrived. The Alaska Highway was different. As one local guide put it, when an army surveyor asked him how to get somewhere, don't know, nobody ever go that way. So they put the Alaska Highway where even the elk and moose don't go. Fortunately, experienced bush pilots were there to help Army surveyors find the best route. Keith, what's this airplane and how significant was this kind of plane in this whole process? David, this is a bush plane and it's very important to the story of the Alaska Highway. This is the mainstay of the transportation system and network in Yukon and Alaska in the 1920s and 30s. If you wanted to get anywhere, particularly with anything heavy, you put it in an airplane and you moved it, people and goods. And when the Army engineers came in in 1942, they had people and goods to move around, and they also needed pilots who knew the terrain, knew the routes, knew the possibilities, because they didn't have a map that showed them where that highway was going to go. The bulldozers and the guys are on the ground, clearing trees and working. Where were the airplanes at that point, and how far away were they? Well, the bush pilots would be up in the air, maybe 5 to 50 miles ahead of the bulldozers, and the surveyors would be out anywhere from 100 yards to 5 miles. So they built this road a few miles at a time, and sometimes only days ahead of the, of the bulldozers was the decision made as to where it was going to go. Flying did help to get a general sense of the route, but eventually the surveyors needed a closer look. And for that, the Army could not have managed without First Nations people, the Clinkets, the Athabascans, and other indigenous peoples of the North Country, like the legendary 
Charlie McDonald. And there's no way to describe how valuable he was to us. So Charlie said, look, I'll show you a different route. And that is what this film is about. Al Eshbox, Home Movies. We're just starting out now, and you see me leaving. And that's the last I saw of the camp for some 30 days. And here we are at famous Muncho Lake. This is the point where we could go no further. And so Charlie said, look, I'll show you a different route. We are coming through a mountain meadow here with an ideal road location site. But in the distance, you can see the rockings that we will eventually work our way around. We arrived at Lower Post, British Columbia. Uh, I coming east, met my other men coming west, which meant we had found a buildable route from Fort St. John to Watson Lake. By the late spring of 42, highway work was going on at an acceptable pace. Then in June, the people who really motivated this whole project gave the Corps of Engineers another huge kick in the pants. June 3rd, airplanes from Japan attack the town of Dutch Harbor in the Aleutian Islands. More than 75 are killed. June 16th, Japan occupies the islands of Attu and Kiska. The Japanese are off the ground in Alaska. Is an invasion of the United States coming? Will the Alcan Highway be completed in time to stop it? Watching the Discovery Channel. Explore your Explore. world. Help the rocket get back. The war dominated America's attention in 1942. Bataan fell in April, Corregidor in the Philippines in May. But at last, there was good news, too. The day after the Japanese attacked Dutch Harbor in Alaska, carrier-based American planes crushed the Japanese fleet at the Battle of Midway. It was the first naval battle in history where the opposing ships never saw each other, fighting entirely by air. It was a stunning demonstration of air power and the importance of having your planes in the right place at the right time. The Japanese didn't attack the Aleutians because they wanted the territory. The attacks were unsuccessful diversions for Midway to draw away American forces. American commanders weren't fooled, but American engineers got hopping. Well, you won't be needing me now that you're getting all these new men. Read it. Japanese forces have occupied Aleutian Islands, Kiska, Atu, and Agatu. Crisis demands redoubled efforts in opening a highway before a scheduled time. Certainly pouring it on, aren't they? We attempted to uh, stay to at least a full day's walk, maybe 20 miles ahead of the bulldozer's clearing. There was a rule that if we were laying down at night sleeping and we heard the bulldozers, we had to get up and get to work because that meant they were close enough to where we had to get some more road located for them. And what were the men following 25 miles behind Al Eschbach doing? Colonel Heath Twitchell wrote to his family. My dears, I thought it might be interesting to take you on a trip over the road. Ten of the biggest caterpillar tractors made are knocking down and clearing out trees. It's a terrific sight to see them crashing through the woods, pushing over trees up to 16 inches in diameter like matchsticks. Behind them come more large caterpillars, grading the road to a rough final shape with various kinds of equipment. Then come a flock of smaller caterpillars, putting the final shape on the road. Then the working parties, doing hand finishing, putting in bridges and culverts. It is a job to test to the full both our men and our equipment. We have no fear that we shall be found wanting. Love, Heath. One of the things my dad was proudest of was his time with the 35th engineers here on the Alaska Highway. And this scene at Muncho Lake is typical of the can-do spirit that he talked a lot about. When they got here in the spring of 1942, that cliff came straight down to the water with no place for a roadbed. When they got ready to do the blasting, what they had to do was find caves along the base of the cliff here 
And that had to be done from underwater. The first person to do this was an officer named Mike Militich. And what he did was he took off all his clothes. They tied a rope around his waist so he could dive off the cliff in case anything happened to him that could fish him out. He found a depression underneath the water line big enough to hold a box of, a box of TNT. He took the box, put it in there. A minute later, enormous explosion, tons of rock into the water forming the beginnings of a roadbed. They repeated that process down the length of the shoreline for a mile. And by the end of the summer, the engineers had a road along Muncho Lake.